little bit about me. As Scott said, uh, my background is in clinical practice and spent um, most of that time in either general practice or uh, emergency medicine. But spent the last 20 years working for technology companies like Microsoft, IBM, GE, and now Orion. Um, and uh, you know, my parents are still confused. Um, they still trying to work out why I made that transition. And, I've given up explaining that to them. I now just tell them I treat computer viruses. It seems to do the trick. <laughs> but the reason I did make the transition out of clinical practice into the IT industry is I believe the biggest innovations that are going to happen in healthcare over the next two decades are going to come from the analysis of data. And <clears throat> what I've learned in my experience with working for these uh, IT companies is it's critical to work for a company that's got both global reach but also a vested interest in the local market, and that's why I transitioned to Orion. So, I'm going to put my glasses on, and I note that I should get some bifocals because I'm starting to look like my dad. Um, the subject that I was given was to paint what the healthcare sector is going to look like in 10 years' time. And if you consider that as a, uh, a graphical representation of our health system now, there's a high probability that it's going to look like this in 2027. <laughs> and that's really our challenge. That's what we've come together today, I think, to talk about. If we all have a desire for innovation and we can see the logic that innovation will bring to patient care, why is it that we're so slow to adopt it? The answer, I think, or certainly part thereof, lies in this famous work by Jeffrey Moore. And I'm going to come back to the slide at the end of the presentation, but it's a very famous slide in business. It's similar to the, uh, the Gartner Harp Circle that Anne-Marie showed. But we know these uh, market segmentation really well as innovators, early adopters, early majority and laggards. But the challenge that's in implicit in the slide is that innovation lives here, and clinicians live there. So if you're going to try and expedite change, you have to be able to recruit your clinicians, and I use that definition broadly, as your sales force. These are the seven trends that I'm going to fly through. Because I don't have much time, I really am going to fly through them. Uh, each, and, each of these trends are really presentations in and of themselves. So I'm going to give a very brief overview on the changing workforce, our evolution as a health sector to, the data, to becoming a true data science, artificial intelligence, holograms, 3D printing, miniaturization, and then I'll talk about blockchain. <coughs> One of my favorite slides is, when I was trained, um, I was trained in a paternal, dictatorial model of medicine, I don't recall ever at medical school being taught about working in a team or empathy or engagement. Instead, I was trained to take control, be directive and accountable for my decisions. But even a pilot who's the apex of, lead of leadership in aviation knows that the system only works where there's enterprise oversight, coordination and teamwork. Medical school enrollments are finding a better balance between EQ and IQ. In 10 years' time, we're going to see a marked difference in our medical graduates. They're likely to be more empathetic and more people people. There's a wonderful study that shows the criticality of building relationships that Im to impact health outcomes. It's from 2004. It's done here in New Zealand. And it showed that in primary care consultations with higher levels of patient-reported physician-patient concordance, it was associated with the one-third greater medication compliance. Basically, the patients were saying if they felt the doctor understood them and they had a real relationship with them, they were one-third more likely to take the medication. Um, I think also there's going to be a continued trend to a feminization of the workforce. Up until uh, the late 60s, only 10% of the, work, the medical workforce was, uh, were women. Medical school enrollments now favour women 60 to 40. Um, that's not a, a statement of judgment. I just think it's a trend and I think it's going to come with pros and cons. This is a study done by the AMA in the US 
And what it looks at is the uh, decisions that um, women and men residents are making in the specialities that they're going to uh, subspecialize in. Females are gravitating to general practice, pediatrics, ONG, and you know these are specialities that you would argue are highly dependent on empathy. <coughs> and the male counterparts are gravitating to specialities where, well, the patient is either unconscious or absent. <laughs> So, once again, I'm not passing judgment here. That might be a good thing. In 10 years' time, we're going to see the formal integration of the informal workforce into the circle of care. Funders, governments, and insurers alike are acutely aware that the medical workforce won't scale to meet all the healthcare needs of the populations. According to the RAND Corporation, the cost of all informal uh, caregiving in the United States is well over $500 billion a year, and in New Zealand, it's estimated that 10% of the population function as caregivers. So we need to get better value from that investment. And I think we're doing well to think in patient-centric terms, but when the patient goes home, they don't have a patient-centric model of care. What you have is a family-centric model of care. And I think in 10 years' time, we will have realized that and moved beyond patient-centricity to family-centricity and architect them more formally into the health system. Okay, so let's talk about our evolution into a true data science. If you look at the history of medicine over the last century, it started in the humanities, and that's because when a patient presented to a clinician in the early part of the century, you could only go by what the patient told you and what you could see. It meant you needed, as a clinician, to rely on, on your knack. It, it was an art form, and that's why it started in the, in the humanities. But as the century progresses with the advent of uh, diagnostics that gave us insight into the internal workings of the body, you see health transition from the humanities into a core science. And later on in the uh, century, uh, spurred on by the genomic revolution and our attempt to digitize the health system, you see us transition to become a data science. We're transitioning, we're not there, we should be there. And why this is going to be a critical milestone where we see ourselves as a data science is that quality is dependent on data. So quality has forever been the pursuit of medicine and yet we're not doing such a great job of ensuring quality. Quality in manufacturing, for example, happens because the data moves with the goods in progress. In healthcare, QA is limited by the ability of the data to move along the patient journey. You know, we even talk about patient records, which are a retrospective our artifact of care. In 10 years' time, we'll be preemptive, and we'll be in that preemptive model will be pervasive. Here's a great example of that happening now. So it's the first hospital command center, it's commissioned by John Hopkins, went live last year purpose-built room with about 60 people who are responsible for patient workflow sitting in a room. They run advanced analytics 24 by 7, taking data feeds from all of their core systems. And the important thing here is it's predicting what's going to happen next. So this isn't just benchmarking. They're running those algorithms against Hopkins' accumulative data set from years and years and years, and the algorithm will predict and so therefore circumvent what's about to go wrong. And through the implementation of this command center, the patient workflow and throughput of QA has improved dramatically in Hopkins. And my prediction is that within five years, no new hospital will be built without a command center of sorts. So they started with patient workflow, and they're now beginning to transition into QA, clinical QA. Here's a great example of clinical QA. Again, work underway at Hopkins. So Muse, modified early warning systems, they're pretty well established. The problem with Muse is that it only picks up deterioration when it's happening. Now that's a good thing, but it would be much more powerful if you could predict who is gonna crash well in advance of them crashing. So what Hopkins have uh, developed is what they call TRUES, which is targeted real-time early warning system. It's a combination of, of machine learning and, and large data sets of patients who've previously developed uh, septicemia. And TRUES learns by watching. It's watching for that particular patient, looking at data feeds and contextual uh, snippets of data points and comparing it to that large data set and trying to predict for that particular patient whether they're gonna crash. 
But what Hopkins had proven is that trues can predict um, deterioration in a patient 24 hours before we clinicians do. They did that on retrospective analysis, but they're now putting it into production in the subacute setting. We, the human being, we're, we are a big data set. It's estimated that we're a composite of about six terabytes of data if you include our you know, genome tr transcriptome and microbiome. And so often we're still focused on the toe here and the ankle of um, you know, the uh, clinical data and imaging. But the big data set is, uh, is within our grasp and we start to contemplate its uh, relevance in, in precision medicine in the way we practice now. But if you look at the impact on etiology of social and behavioral choices, they predominate. And this emphasizes the need for us to be looking at the longitudinal record for our patients. The challenge for the health system is that people living with chronic diseases live almost out of view of the health system. The average New Zealander spends about 40 minutes a year with their GP. That re represents 0.01% of the longitudinal record. And even if they were admitted for a week, that would only represent 2% of the data points for the year. So we're making decisions really on snippets of those data points. We don't have the full patient image. Lots of reason for us to be optimistic though. The community is digitizing rapidly. Of the two million uh, apps on the Apple App Store, an estimated 100,000 of them are medical apps, and the same is true for Android. And it's estimated that the wearable market will grow to 250 million wearables by 2019. So the ability for the health system to see people living with chronic diseases is well within our grasp. We shouldn't be seeing little pockets of people wearing devices when you've got 250 million of them out there. The rate in the decline in the cost of genomic sequencing is outperforming Moore's Law by three to four times and is estimated by 2020 it's going to cost as little as 10 bucks. So by then we're going to have our genome on our phone. So no doubt what we're going to see over the next 10 years is an exponential growth in both the longitudinal, if we smart, and the clinical record and it's going to empower us to have a much better patient image than the image we have now. I wanted to transition now to artificial intelligence. So last year, the law firm Baker and Hostetler, they were the first company to employ Ross. Ross is an artificial intelligence lawyer. It's built on IBM's cognitive computer Watson. And Ross works in their bankruptcy practice. You ask it a question in plain English, like you would a colleague or Siri, and Ross then reads through the entire body of law and returns the cited answers and list of readings for you. Despite America's litigious nature, it's estimated that only that it's estimated that 80 percent of Americans can't afford a lawyer. AI is going to make law more affordable, and that's the potential it brings to health. Last year, Google published work demonstrating that its deep learning algorithm had the ability to outperform pathologists in picking up breast <coughs> cancer metastases. In fact, their algorithm showed an 89% accuracy as compared to 73% for the pathologists and was able to do that without time constraints. So big data companies like Google, are going to become, who already are core components of a health system, are going to become core parts of our health infrastructure. The term Dr. Google has already become a household phrase. And if you want to know how people will search for information in 10 years' time, you need only look at the online behavior of teens. This chart from Northwest University shows the parent as the primary source of health information. That's more evidence for why we need to integrate the informal workforce into the formal workforce. And the doctor comes in third place Close, followed closely behind by the internet, but here's the really interesting thing. A quarter of the people going online seeking information are very satisfied with what they find. So we've got to be thinking of search as one of the core bits of our infrastructure. To be fair on Google, let's look at their competition, Bing. In 2007, Microsoft purchased a medical search engine called MedStory. 
unlike Google, that preferences popular content, MedStory preferences peer-reviewed content. So it's the MedStory algorithms that drive uh, being searched when you search for a medical term, and therefore, in theory, it's going to re return a better quality um, list of articles. Also, in the same way that Google demonstrated in 2008 that it could predict the flu epidemic two weeks before the CDC could, Microsoft this year announced they could predict if somebody had pancreatic cancer based on their online search. So, search engines are going to offer health economies a uh, ability to do low-cost screening at scale. The more we look at them as core parts of our infrastructure, and there's a, obviously a long way to go. When Google missed the flu epidemic in 2013, they canned the project. And that's a big mistake. If we gave up medicine every time we did thing, you know, did something wrong, there'd be no medical workforce. They really should return to that work. I want to talk briefly about holograms. I think that holograms are going to be one of the biggest disruptors in the next next decade. Unlike video conferences, and that's starting to become, well, not pervasive, but um, present. Um, I think the challenge with, uh, with, uh, with video conferencing is it's still largely two-dimensional. It doesn't feel real. With holograms, the clinician will be in the room, and that will aid in engagement and a more meaningful experience for the patient. We're already seeing some fantastic uh, experimentation with hologram. This is Microsoft's hologram technology called HoloLens. They're using it to augment dissection in medical education. They're using it in uh, pre-planning for surgery. And one of the really cool things I came across when researching what they've been doing is they're overlaying the ultrasound image on the patient so the ultrasound operator doesn't have to turn away and look at the screen. Here's a personal prediction. I think over the next 10 years we're going to see the emergence of healthcare avatars. So, you know, avatar is kind of a digital representation of yourself, but it's kind of an, an image. Um, I think that these avatars are going to be an image, a reflection of your health or your ill health. The challenge we have now in getting people to engage is it's very hard for people to, um, you know, to quantify their health. We use surrogate measures like fitness and uh, the frequency, you know, the calorie consumption, but they, they're kind of surrogate measures. What I'm predicting will happen is that these avatars will vis help you visualize your state of health or ill health. It's going to be a composite of your UV exposure, telomere deg degradation, your calorie consumption, pathogen exposure, cell health, all those type of things. And they're going to help you make better choices by helping you visualize the impact of your good and your bad choices. And this screen scrape that you see in the slide is actually a two-dimensional version of that from a company called My Health Advertar, would you believe? In 10 years time, 3D printing is going to be pervasive. Every house will have a 3D printer. And there's great strides being made in 3D printing, in organ regeneration, and in prosthetic construction. But the application of 3D printing that really intrigues me most is the printing of medication. Drop-off rates from patients along to medica... <laughs> oh, okay, well, I'll skip a bit. <coughs> so, um, you know, the drop-off rates from uh, poor compliance with patients on long-term medication is drastic. 50% drop-off within, within six months. Um, but imagine if you could print the medication, all your medication in a single tablet when it's needed. That's going to help with dispensing. It's also going to help pick up real time where you've got people dropping off their meds so you can get in there and, do it quick, uh, and, and intervene quickly. Research at the University College of London, they've shown that the shape of the pill actually affects its absorption by the amount of surface area exposed. So you can customise a tablet for a particular individual depending on the rate of absorption that you want. Um, I'm going to skip across, uh, to a few things. I will mention Bitcoin. Uh, if you haven't heard of Bitcoin, it's the technology that underpins the online currency um, no, sorry, uh, blockchain. If you haven't got a blockchain, blockchain is the uh, technology that underpins the online currency for Bitcoin. While this is going to be a major disruption of the next decade, is at the moment you need an, a, a, a impartial arbiter of a transaction. This is why the banks are really nervous about this. At the moment, the banks have to arbitrate a, con a transaction. They have to prove that you are you and I am I and that the money you're going to give me is real. In blockchain, 
you obviate the need for the bank. In fact, the whole blockchain it authenticates that transaction. And at the moment, so blockchains, immutable ledgers, almost impossible to defraud, has been used in currency exchange, but it can also be used to uh, exchange information. By definition, it's got a master the patient index in there. And you can also embed entitlements into your identity. So a patient could arrive to a consultation already knowing what they're entitled to. Something you re we really need to experiment with. So that was a fly through, those seven trends. So I'd like to close by talking about adoption. So if we're so excited about adoption, how do we expedite it? And we need to look at our history to ground ourselves on why we're so slow. So René Lanek, the guy on the slide, is a French physician. He invented the stethoscope in 1816. At the time, it was common practice for physicians to put their ear to a patient's chest and listen to the sounds, but he was in a social circumstance with a young woman where he couldn't, so he rolled up a piece of paper into a cone, put it to his ear, and not only did he hear, found that he could hear the sounds of heart and lungs, but they were actually uh, they were amplified. And then he went on to produce a whole range of these uh, stethoscopes in wood. But it wasn't until 1866, 50 years later, that Orson Flint, who was a, a, a well-renowned and outspoken physician, endorsed the stethoscope that we saw the, the mass ad adoption of it. That's a 50-year lag. So we have to understand that lag if we're going to try and expedite adoption. And that's why I wanted to return to this chart by Jeffrey Moore that I uh, showed at the beginning of the slide, at the beginning of the presentation. So Jeffrey Moore produced this uh, work in his book, Crossing the Chasm. And we know well these market segmentations of the early adopter and laggards and early majority, but that's not why Jeffrey Moore wrote the book. He wrote the book to describe the chasm that exists between those early adopters and the early majority. See, the early adopters, they're visionaries. They're prepared to back their reputation on a new innovation. Whereas most of the rest of uh, the health workforce are pragmatists. We're interested in innovation, but we're not ready to buy it until other pragmatic co-workers see this as market ready. So the type of organizations that would, you'd put in the early adopter uh, side of the chasm would be the Mayo Clinics and the Harvards who have deep innovation pools and see themselves as risk takers, but for the majority of the health system, we live the other side of the chasm. Jeffrey Moore's advice is that if you want to cross the chasm, you have to focus on the pragmatist. You've got to prove to them that the technology is effective, but also that it's safe. And if you want a great example of an industry that does this well, look at the pharmaceutical industry. They go to a great deal of effort to gather the data to prove that their molecule is better than the one you currently use. And here's the important thing. They go to a great deal of effort to get the data that proves that your peers are already embracing that change. And when they show you that data, you transition across. So if we want to see the kind of future that I think we're all aligned on, we're going to have to partner as a, as a health sector with these companies, not step back and wait for them to prove the evidence of impact, but to embrace the change and say that this will have impact and we prepare to experiment within the right framework in our own countries. And I think New Zealand's history of Kiwi ingenuity probably puts New Zealand as one of the best petri dishes for experimenting and therefore expediting with the right evidence framework and bring these technologies in a different future in 10 years' time. Thank you.